Bastard, biggest majority in the House of Commons. The new statesman, the Right Honourable Alan Bastard, was the Bastard child of 80s greed and 80s politics. In 1987, Margaret Thatcher had just won her third general election and Britain was divided as never before. We hated the Conservative government because of the unhappiness that they caused for so many people. There was us spitting image and private eye and everyone else had given up. So we just felt we had to go in there and, and start kicking and biting and scratching. And the new sitcom was to do exactly that. Mr. Bastard, I will briefly yield to the honourable member for Halton Price, Mr. Speaker, because it's always interesting to hear the crypto fascist <laughs> ravings of the loony right. Au contraire, Mr. Speaker. Which I translate as that's what you think for the benefit of the member for Braemore who probably never went to school. It was September 1987 when the new statesman first made his outrageous presence felt. When I say that we are sick and tired of this sort of lefty trot whinging. The new statesman, the unacceptable face of Thatcherism, would go on to radically change TV satire and ultimately the face of British politics. Undoubtedly there's something about his sliminess and ambition which was recognisable in certain characters in the House of Commons, particularly uh, in the Tory party. Dear Mr Massad, I'm unemployed and I can't afford to feed my family. And out in the real world, viewers recognised the truth when they saw it. We've never seen audience reaction like it before, ever, uh, in any of the shows we'd ever done, um, where a recording would have to stop because people were too hysteric. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. I've got 50 feet for a cup of tea. Well, of course I have. What a stupid question. The New Statesman was a successful marriage of two different comedy styles, mainstream sitcom and popular alternative comedy. The creature the marriage produced was a compelling character that has resonated through politics ever since. Sorry, sir. Members only. I am a member. I've got the largest majority in the house. Name? The star. I believe you're my job. <laughs> it might have been Neil Simon or some brilliant American writer said, all comedy is two Jews fighting. And we are all comedy. Two-thirds of the team that would create the New Statesman was itself one of the most successful writing partnerships in television history, a hit factory for 25 years. Lawrence Marks and Maurice Gran started out as a journalist and a civil servant, but in 1974 stumbled upon a writer's group. They had sketch writing competitions every couple of months, and we did quite well in those. Um, and seemed to be able to make people laugh. But it was another four years before they got their first break, writing traditional gags for Frankie Howard's radio show. This gained Marks and Gran an entree to the mainstream, and in 1980 they got their own ITV series, Holding the Fort. I don't have a younger sister, Hector. This is my mother. You're, You're talking about the secret of eternal youth. <laughs> no secret, Hector. Mother simply surrounds herself with young people. <laughs> Male, mostly. Thank you. 1980 also saw one of the country's most outrageous young comedians burst onto our TV screens. But Rick Mayle seemed to be kicking against Marks and Grand's mainstream style. I remember we did Waiting for Godot at school and we did some uh, Stoppard at school and that's why I thought I'd go to university to study drama. Manchester was where Rick met Adrian Edmondson. Bored with straight theatre, they began performing as a double act called 20th Century Coyote. Gigs followed at the Comedy Store in London, a haven for a new group of emerging and like-minded alternative comedians. They were spotted by TV producer Paul Jackson, who wasted no time getting them onto Boom Boom, Out Go the Lights. Mail cornered the market in dysfunctional investigative journalists as Kevin Turvey in the BBC's A Kick Up the 80s. And here's a good one. Why does Mrs Thatcher always wear barbed wire underwear? She doesn't. It's a joke. <laughs> and he also developed a character closer to home. Imagine there's a poet who comes on with a lot of political poets and beautiful poets and great poets and this, that and the other. And then an utter twat comes on uh, who can't say his R's properly and is obviously in love with Vanessa Redgrave and has written lots of poems about her. And when the, this is what was really brilliant. Was when I came on and said, hello, my name's Vic. And, uh, and someone would laugh. Shut up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I to read the angry love poem that I've written, and it's called Vanessa. <laughs> shut up! And I just get really, really angry with the audience. I started just going, shut up, shut up! <laughs> this is really serious poetry. Really, right? And they, they, then they'd really erupt in laughing, but they tried to stop themselves laughing. It, 
Because it wasn't a comedy evening, right? It was a poetry evening. Vanessa, I shall go to my grave with a bleeding heart. But at least it will be a red grave. <laughs> Shut up! One of the people who saw Rick doing Rick was Lawrence Marx. Male made a mixed impression. I thought this guy's got such great comic timing, but he's probably raving mad. Paul Jackson also saw alternative sitcom potential in the acts performing at the comedy store, and as a result, the young ones crashed into our living rooms in 1982. I've got the right to my MP. But you haven't got an MP, Rick. You're an anarchist. <laughs> ah, well, then I shall write to the lead singer of Echo and the Bunny Men. <laughs> It was anarchic and political, but it was also physical, slapstick and cartoonish, giving the cast the freedom to indulge their wickedest fantasies. You say, um, can I have um, a head that explodes? You say, yeah, no problem with it. Yeah, I'll have you that by two o'clock, don't worry about it. And you think of a joke and there it is. While the young ones caused mayhem on BBC Two, ITV chose to launch a gentler comedy with a domestic setting. It was written by Marks and Gran, by now an established, reliable team. Shine On Harvey Moon is a humorous social commentary on post-war Britain, but during filming, the political climate outside the studios had an impact on the writers. I can never understand your sort of working class Toryism. Anyone would think we had a few bob. What have they ever done for the likes of us? Every step forward the common man has made in this country has been opposed by the bosses and their political lackeys. No, Morris and I were making Shine on Harvey Moon in Nottingham during the miners' strike. And the more I was watching the population of Yorkshire villages starving, the more I was hating Thatcher. Neil, the bathroom's free, unlike the country under the Thatcherite junta. Marx and Gran came from a very different comedy world to male, but their political agendas were similar. It isn't wholly surprising that the two different, the, if you like, the serious analysis of politics and the ludicrous analysis of politics of the time should have got together. Paul Jackson says to me, why don't you come to the something in somewhere like Cheltenham, but some kind of television festival or television awards ceremony or something like that. And he came and said, uh, said, I think you might like to meet these guys. And that's where I met Lawrence Morris. We met Rick Mail, who said, would you create a, a series for me? And we didn't want to because we thought he'd be really annoying and, and, and trouble. Their styles might have been totally different, but what they had in common was comedy. I was invited to a gentleman called Dino De Laurentiis' party one evening. That was my first big Hollywood party, and that was the time that I actually heard somebody say to somebody else, I love your nose, where did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> Rick Mayo. Yes, uh, hello. Hello, everybody. After all appearing on the same episode of Wogan, they met for lunch, and Marks and Gran were relieved Rick wasn't as bad as they feared. He described to us... Uh, that he, in fact, enjoys playing characters that, in that enjoy murder, rape, violence, theft of property, street crime, anything that was really bad. Why? And coward. And greed. And lying. And avarice. And we said, you want to play a Tory backbencher? I did not say that I opposed abortion. What I oppose is the so-called woman's right to choose. It should be the state's right to choose. Ugly, stupid, poor people should not be allowed to have children. With their star playing a corrupt Tory MP, they just needed a channel brave enough to commission the idea. Although I was commissioning editor, uh, I still have to sell the show on to my boss to be able to get the money in the first place. So he always wants to know what it's about. And writers hate doing synopses. Because you're frightened it will drain away the things you want to put into the show. They came up with the idea of creating a who's who entry for their character. The Stard's recreations got them noticed pretty quickly. Making money, dining at expensive restaurants at other people's expense, grinding the faces of the poor. We then put the reply to this entry from Who's Who, who said, Dear Mr Bastard, your entry is of inordinate length for a new boy. For example, it's a line longer than Lord Hailsham's entry. Bastard then replied to that, saying, Re your letter, re my letter, bollocks. Yours were the biggest majority in the House of Commons, the Right Honourable Alan Beresford Bastard MP, P.S. Who the fuck is Lord Hailsham? And that's what we sent to Yorkshire Television. And by return, 
he rang up and said, when do you want to do it? At that time, comedy had settled very comfortably into mum and dad and two children. Um, it was, by and large, very domestic. It's wallet time, mother. What? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't speak unemployed. This came up as being something totally, utterly different, and it gave us satire back um, in the 80s, which I felt was desperately important. The combination of male and Marks and Grand's different comedy styles had the potential to create something explosive, perfect for ITV's 10pm Sunday slot. Scathing about a powerful sitting government, it was a brave but risky commission. One major problem was transforming Mail from a physical performer into a Conservative MP, not known for flexibility. Oh, Rick, man, that's really heavy, man. <laughs> I hate rats, OK? It's what he would have wanted. I've always wanted to put cartoons, or be a cartoon. Um, and, there are, and so, as you lead towards the Statesman, that was a sort of swerve away from that. The director appointed to work with Mail to find his new character was Geoffrey Sachs. Prior to working on the new statesman, Sachs was getting laughs out of the rubber puppets on Spitting Image. He had been entrusted with bringing Rowan Atkinson to the screen in his first TV show, Canned Laughter, and started his career on End of Part One, a surreal sitcom by Andrew Marshall and David Renwick. There was a time when we were quite sort of depressed and thinking, we're never going to find this character. Piers? Yes? Your father's dead. <laughs> But during rehearsals, the true Bastard gradually emerged. It suddenly occurred to us that it would be a lot better if he just, he just didn't care less. I promise to get down and see him next week. Well, you have to go down a lot further if you want to see him now, isn't it? <laughs> Instead of playing him angry as a sort of bastard, it, it, we went the other way completely and played it so that it didn't occur to him that the things he was doing were in any way sort of morally reprehensible. Piers, 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 Piers. It was only a joke. Oh, really? No, not really. He's dead, all right. <laughs> Aspects of your character which you disapprove of are um, sort of pressed down and hidden away in, in the back somewhere where you don't like those bits of yourself, right? And the character comes up and goes, ah, oh, I like him. And all those bits that you've put away can be put in there. So I think it's because there's a lot of me in Alan that I disapprove of, that's why I do him so well. His look was also important. She likes her boys well turned out. Look at us, parky, bakey, <laughs> meaty. We all get our suits in Savile Row. Well, I mean, where did you get that thing? Swindon. We said the, the big thing about Tories is their hair. They've all got little curly bits over their ears. It's Norman Fowler. Uh, like Norman Fowler. It's because but it's because they comb their hair with a wet comb. That's what toffs do. Where are you going to find a large number of stupid, greedy people rich enough to invest in a dubious scheme like this? Political sleaze was to contribute to the Tories losing the 97 election, and the phrase was a perfect description of Bastard. And in their drive for accuracy, the writers enlisted the Labour peeress, Renée Short, to get the technical facts right, but had called on political help from the start. I just wrote to my local MP. Um, Michael Portillo and said, Dear Mr Portillo, I am a writer. I am going to be writing about a um, Conservative backbencher. I wonder if you would give us the time to show us around the House of Commons. If you're going to write, you know, uh, a realistic sort of drama about the House of Commons, you want to know about these nooks and crannies where people do the plotting and the scheming. The bars, the smoking rooms, the libraries, all the places that the public is usually not allowed and that you don't even see photographs of. Maggie! Love the trouser suit! <laughs> oh, sorry, Hesseltine, I didn't know it was you. Later, when the programme started, news got out that I had helped them, and this somehow then became confused with the idea that I was the model for Alan Bastard. Of course he's not. But uh, the problem with publicity is then you've got to keep the enigma going. So say, I can't tell you that, rather than no. So this, the truth is always very opaque. I might be doing it now. Even people who didn't think I was the model for Alan Bastard thought 
what a bastard I was for allowing these three into the House of Commons to make a series about a very unflattering portrait of a Conservative MP and a, and a series that did the Conservative Party no good at all. The series promised to be controversial and started with a bang. Alan Bastard kills off his two election opponents to become the Tory member for the Yorkshire constituency of Halton Price. His strategy delivered him the largest majority in the House of Commons. As long, William Richard. Labour. 3,237. <laughs> Bastard, Alan Beresford. Conservative. 31,756. <laughs> controversy was only just beginning. The combination of Marx and Grand's carefully constructed narrative and male slapstick antics created a savage new type of satire. It was a stroke of genius. Combining what exclusively Thatcherism represented with Punch and Judy, and that's sort of what it was. It was cartoony at, at one level, but you know, there's certain elements of truth even in Mr. Punch. Bastard reveled in brutality, both physical and verbal. As a conservative backbencher in Margaret Thatcher's government, he caused trouble wherever he went. God did not put animals on this earth merely to wander around aimlessly like the Labour front bench. <laughs> Bastard blackmailed and abused his way through life and was forever dreaming up corrupt money-making schemes all in the name of his Thatcherite values. Well, I think that proves that balanced television doesn't have to be dark. Alan Bastard is charming, ruthless, good-looking, Beelzebub, cunning as a snake, arrogant and devious, a complete and utter Bastard. The supporting characters were equally unflattering but still realistic. Much of Bastard's grotesque behaviour was targeted at Piers Fletcher Dervish. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. Bastard's hapless sidekick, best friend and fellow Tory backbencher was played by Michael Troughton. Fingers, Piers. <laughs> Fingers. <laughs> you don't kiss Alan. I think the purpose that Piers served was that... Um, it was a, a, a good whipping boy for Alan. He could, he could be really cruel. But half of £2,000 is... Pierce represented the old school of traditional upper-class twit conservative wets. Point not, not five, seven, three, eight, nine. <laughs> As did their other companion, Sir Stephen Baxter. We'd be better off with a performing seal, really, wouldn't we? <laughs> Sex is wrong. That's what my fiancé's always said. <laughs> sex without marriage is a mortal sin, and yet sex within marriage is an enemy to domestic harmony. This is the work of a genius. She sums up my last 47 years in a nutshell. Alan Bastard, when he became an MP in the first episode, he shared an office in the House of Commons with a young Tory MP and a very old Tory MP. And Michael Troughton played the young one, who was pretty dim, and um, I played the old one, who was extremely dim. Sir Stephen Baxter was played by John Nettleton, who had a track record in political satire, as prior to the new statesman he was Sir Arnold Robinson in Yes Minister. Well, Chance Humphrey, I'm only Cabinet Secretary, I'm not the political correspondent of the new standard. <laughs> I played a reptilian, very intellectual Whitehall Mandarin. Um, so when um, I was approached about being in the new statesman, I rather leapt at the chance. Alan picked on peers, they both picked on Sir Stephen, but Sir Stephen had some seniority so he could occasionally get a blow back in. I think you should know, Bastard, I'm reporting you. Let her Darby stop that at once. This is not the Liberal Party. Stard also had the perfect trophy Tory wife, and his marriage was as corrupt and dodgy as his political career. Let us pray. I don't know why I've married you. You married me, my darling, as your nouveau riche, whereas I can trace my family tree back to Edward II. Amen. <laughs> and because my father's chairman of the local Conservative Association, I your parliamentary seat in his gift. Yes, well, it was a rhetorical question, wasn't it? <laughs> Alan did epitomise the Tory party. He married well. Yes, he married Posh. And, of course, Posh was played by Posh, because Marsha Fitzalan Howard being the daughter of the Duke of Norfolk, was about as posh as you come. If you want 
a loyal, helpful, supportive Tory wife pay off my credit card bill? Well, I would do, darling, but it's a choice between paying your dress bill and personally financing Britain's independent nuclear deterrent. <laughs> Although she's a great, talented actress, she didn't have too much acting to, d to do. Uh, she was a most believable Tory wife. Fitzalan's TV career began in 1975 in Upstairs Downstairs. She played super posh Caroline Bingley in Pride and Prejudice, then broke into sitcom playing an accounts girl in Shelley. But Sarah Bastard in The New Statesman was a complete departure. I'd done lots of these really tired, boring sitcoms with a three-piece suite. Whereas this was just incredible what they dared do. Well, that's politics, Fluffy Bottom. <laughs> Listen, moustache, fast running. All right, darling. Uh, yearn for you longingly. Sarah Bastard is just as sick as Alan, because it's in her blood. And the fact that she's shacking everybody and Alan's shacking everybody and they keep up pretense of being outraged at each other. And the morality is just appalling. I'm your little rabbit. And I'm a rabbit too. <laughs> right, I'm off down Sphinx Furnace to commit adultery. <laughs> Vivian Heilbronn was Alan's publicist Beatrice, who kept Sturm about having it off with Sarah. Will it keep until morning? That will. I won't. He doesn't have a clue about what is going on. And that was rather fun to do, so the conversations with um, Alan are underpinned by the knowledge of the relationship that is going on between Beatrice and Sarah. The first series averaged seven million viewers, figures which were helped by huge publicity. It trod a fine line between reality and fiction, and was soon being used by the press as a reference point for real events, a sure sign of success. Three weeks into its run, in 87, uh, a Daily Mirror front page splashed headline was What a Bastard, and the name had just sort of permeated its way into the national consciousness. The Bastard character was just um, a typical example of what the Tory party at that particular time was going through, so therefore he became utterly believable. All I did was tell her the truth! The fatal mistake for a politician, Piers! <laughs> New Statesman had one foot in reality, one foot in fantasy, except sometimes the fantasy side was actually more real than the reality side because I think they were doing things in the fantastic stories that they came up with, which a week later would end up in the newspapers as real. We can't dump it here. Why not? Because the mine runs under a school, that's why not. You can't dump nuclear fuel under an infant school. It's only a council school. And then about four weeks later... There's a big story in one of the papers saying that an MP has, or a school in Grimsby has a consignment of nuclear waste found under the school. It did become a, f a fact of uh, life imitating art um, because many of the things that the writers dreamed up and did with Rick just turned out to be true. But why did we welcome the hideous bastard into our homes? I hate queers almost as much as I hate poor people. <laughs> I think the reason people like him is because... He's not a hypocrite. He makes no bones about being greedy, depraved and cowardly. He's the only character in fiction, in all languages, at all times, who is proud of having a very small penis and taking a very short time to reach sexual climax. How was that? Great. There can't be many men you can use to time a pan of soft-boiled quail eggs. <laughs> Fifty-five seconds. Perfect. Less than a minute, eh? Getting quicker. So his egotistical self-confidence could have no greater sort of badge than that. Remember the Falklands Gulf? Indeed I do. I made a fortune. <laughs> so you could say he, he allows the audience to indulge its dark side. What did he say about the National Health Service? In the good old days, you were poor, you got ill, and you died. People just laugh and applaud because he's stripping away the hypocrisy and people think deep down that's what these politicians think. A show like this always sails very close to the wind, uh, by virtue of its, its theme. If one were to just publish the lawyer's letters we received weekly from 
um, the lawyer at Yorkshire Television, it would make a very interesting volume. The scripts had to be read very carefully, um, just to make sure, because libel was always tapping very quietly at our door. That information will cost you. How much? An archer. A whole Jeffrey. That's two thousand pounds. <laughs> Lawyers' demands also meant last-minute changes. You'd get messages while you were in makeup or wherever saying, "By the way, do not say Norman Lamont. Substitute Norman Lamont with." Cecil Parkinson or something, and you think, fucking hell, you know. The series was recorded before a live audience, and the more up to the minute the stories, the bigger the laughs. <laughs> the audience are in, the cameras are there, I'm sitting at the side like this. Morris comes up and says, hey, Rick, quick, look, here's five good ones. Here's five good one-liners about something, maybe there'd been a plane crash that day, so there were a couple of sick one-liners about that, and just got to slither them in. Um, I don't ever remember being, thinking, oh, for God's sake, about this. I was thinking what heaven I was in. You've got a really shit-hot, rehearsed show, and here comes some extra gags. I mean, it's like raining gags. And the buzz of the place was so intense that Morris and I decided that we wouldn't sit in the producer's box we would actually sit in the audience with the audience because we might never experience this again in our careers you know in fact i feel like getting down on my knees right now and giving thanks <laughs> male's talent as both a physical performer and comedy writer meant he had a big creative input <laughs> thank you lord most situation comedies at the time you know you got the script and that's what you shot and with us we were changing it in the rehearsal room because rick would come up with ideas <laughs> It was very prone to create elaborate business. So you'd write a line which said, Rick hits peers. And you'd come back about two days later to rehearsal, and there would now be a five minute torture sequence. Bottom, please, Pearson. <laughs> and the director would say, We're ten minutes over now. And uh, Rick would say, Well, just can't you remove half the story so I can stick this thing up Pierce's bottom? And we used to have to really fight for plot, so there's a real creative tension between Rick's theatricality and our saying, we must tell the story of the week. You see the window? <laughs> Say sorry, Piers. <laughs> 50 pounds for the window pane. Political insolence was not new to viewers of ITV's 10pm Sunday slot. In the late 80s, Spitting Image was the New Statesman's only satirical ally. I'm always awakened by the shrill sounds of the dawn chorus which filters through the windows. Director Jeffrey Sachs had come to the New Statesman from Spitting Image and brought with him Steve Nallen, a.k.a. Mrs. Thatcher. Would you like to order, sir? Yes, I will have a steak. How'd you like it? Oh, raw, please. And what about the vegetables? Oh, they'll have the same as me. You could dismiss Spitting Image as, as a silly puppet show. The fact that you could watch Alan Bastard and for a few moments watching that think, actually, this is a documentary. That was its true strength and genius. Cecil! <laughs> I thought I told her to use the back entrance! I'd suggested that if she was in the face pack and had the curlers in, it might be quite nice if she took her teeth out. I was just trying to be true to the spirit of Thatcherism. All you care about is number one. I thought that's what Thatcherism was all about. <laughs> of course it is, of course it is. And because I could only speak as my grandmother, doing the northern accent, Mrs Thatcher suddenly turned all Yorkshire. For some reason, I never worked out why. I don't think people appreciate the enormous pressure that's on writers, directors and actors when comedy is made. It was pretty much a seven-day job. We rehearsed, this is in London, on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday we travelled to Leeds, we did a walkthrough in Leeds. Friday, dress rehearsal, tech and dress and record the show. Friday night, OK, in front of a live audience. Get very drunk, right? Wake up somewhere, uh, 11 is on Saturday. Everybody travelled back to London drunk on a Saturday. Crash out, wake up Sunday morning. <coughs> Straight to you, read through, start again. We were so exhausted by the end of the set second series that we decided to kill him. Uh, we both agreed there wasn't any argument why kill off this wonderful character. Please, Captain. I've for two weeks. Well, force yourself. 
and I thought it would be really good to do a really shocking ending, to make it look very graphic and look like it was something out of a th thriller. I remember saying that we, we need a bullet hit um, right by, right actually on the windscreen, right by you, and I remember him saying, is this going to be safe? And I said, look, with respect, Rick, these guys do this every day. Well, anyway, they fired the bullet at the screen and it, it bounced off and it whizzed past Rick's eyes and, I mean, a, another inch and he would now be sort of partially sighted. And he just turned around and said, well, thanks very much indeed. And I just didn't know what to say, but it looked great on the screen. It really did. It happened at 3.47 p.m. as Mr. Bastard was coming out of the Department of the Environment. He was rushed to Charing Cross Hospital, but was found to be... When you've got something successful as a commissioning editor, you're desperate to hang on to it and not throw it away. I took Rick out to lunch, and it was a wonderful, boozy, relaxed lunch, and it went on and on and on for ages. And I talked about ambition and family and life in general. And only when we got to the coffee did I ask him to do another series. Um, and he almost sighed with relief that I'd actually got to the question that we both knew why I'd taken him out to lunch. Uh, that's why we did another series. They were also keen to bring it back because it won a BAFTA. And like Mrs Thatcher, Bastard was successful both at home and abroad. <laughs> we were entered for an international Emmy, and being a very mean and selfish boss, I flew over to New York. I'd taken all the brickbats, so I felt I was due for it. It wasn't a wasted jolly because the New Statesman won the Emmy. The cast and crew were invited to a party, not in New York, but downtown Leeds. And there was the Emmy in all its glory. We didn't know that someone at the airport had dropped it and the wings had fallen off and someone at Yorkshire Television had put them on upside down because they'd never seen an Emmy before. So Bastard bobbed up for a third time. But there had to be a reshuffle as director Geoffrey Sachs was no longer available. He was enjoying a quieter life directing the BBC's Sleepers, which clashed with the new statesman. Eventually, Sachs made his way to Hollywood, where he directed the family blockbuster Stormbreaker. But in the UK in the 90s, even bigger political changes were afoot. Mrs Thatcher was ousted as Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time. Real life had overtaken the new statesman, causing problems for the writers. There was Hasseltine Heard Major fighting to take over. We thought if Heard gets made PM, we'll be all right, because we know quite a lot about him. And if Hasseltine, it will be even better. And bugger me if it's not John Major. And nobody knows anything about John Major at all. The wind had gone out of the sails of the Tory party. During Series 3, Bastard toyed with crossing the floor to the Labour benches, which was eerily in tune with the feeling in the Conservative Party at the time. Why, why join the Labour Party? You're, you're ahead in the polls. It's just so boring being a Tory now that Maggie's left. I mean, have you ever had a conversation with John Major? No. I'm not saying he's dull, but he is the only boy in history to run away from the circus to join a firm of accountants. <laughs> this was getting a bit close to the bone, because during that period there were quite a lot of Tory MPs who could see that the Tory government was coming to an end and they hadn't become ministers themselves. And there was really um, quite a trickle, well, moving towards an avalanche of Conservative MPs who were going over to the Labour side. Once again, at the end of Series 3, they tried hard to get rid of Bastard. We were really knackered, we were really exhausted. We said, oh my God, we can't go through this again. Let's send him off to the Russian gulag. I'm going home. Is there anything you'd like me to give Sarah for you? <laughs> There's no way he's going to come back from that, but bugger me, back he came. You know why he came back? The wall came down. That's right, the bloody Berlin the Wall ball, came down. I mean, the one thing we couldn't... Have uh, anticipated You know, happens. that was just such... We couldn't get rid of Bastard. Such bad luck, such bad luck. So we had to bring him back again. So, whenever they tried to dump him, events conspired to bring Bastard back. By series four, he had mutated into a Euro MP, but eventually, enough was enough. Politics was dull. I remember us wandering around in the United States, it's really boring this decade, isn't it? So Alan wasn't sort of required. His job was to assassinate Thatcher, and that job had been done. And he was so good, he carried on for a while, and then we said, no, come on, let's just stop. The new statesman had run its course, but Marx and Grand were still going strong. During the star's reign of terror, they launched Alamo, their own production company, which produced Birds of a Feather. You have no right to talk oh, to me shut like that! Up. Everyone around here knows you're the most popular ride outside Dalton Towers! <laughs> After the new statesman, Mail reverted to type, and with his old pal Adrian Ebenson, created Bottom, a byword for rude, violent pantomime. I think I must be hallucinating. Well, we'll soon find out. <laughs> <laughs> now, did that hurt? <laughs> yes, my 
Italy. Mayle tried his hand in Hollywood with Drop Dead Fred, but in 1998, real disaster struck. The comedian Rick Mayle is in hospital with serious head injuries after an accident at his country home in Devon. By 2002, Mayle was reunited with Marks and Gran and there were high hopes for their ITV series Believe Nothing. Which had some great ideas in it, wasn't sufficiently different. In a way, it was, it was like the new statesman in disguise. Believe Nothing was cancelled after the first series. It seemed the spark had gone out of their relationship. Our choir is 100% castrato. 35 strapping choristers and not an atom of testosterone among them. <laughs> Luckily, I have the libido of three dozen men, which balances things up. Mayle believes that once you've achieved success with a character, you're best leaving him alone. Advice handed down at a meeting with one of his heroes, Little Richard. Always stop at the top. Always stop at the top. He's talking about waiting. You get the stage, you stand at the side, and he gets the band on first, and you get, get them to hop the audience up. So you get the audience high. Get them, get them high before you get on that stage. So they're already high. When you get on that stage, you take them higher. And take them higher till the king get no higher. And when the king get no higher, you get off that stage. And my principal agreed with that. This principal was tested when he heard that Marks and Graham were cooking up a 21st century version of the New Statesman. And then the boys this year said, well, we'll just do Alan again. And I said, no, because Little says, you know, we stop at a tap. But they presented me the script, and I thought, don't, Rick, don't, don't, wait, no, yeah, this is good. And they come up with the concept that Alan Bastard invented New Labour. With the need for political satire as strong as ever in 2006, Marx and Gran obliged by resurrecting Bastard on the stage. There is a path to immortality. He had changed his political colours, moved into number nine Downing Street, and was the brains behind New Labour. To go down in history is a single unique attribute. Hmm? All you have to do, Tony, is to cling to power until November the 26th, 2008. And you will have been at number 10 a whole day longer than Mrs. Thatcher. Hmm? Yeah. The hatred for the establishment that there was in the 80s is why Alan uh, existed then. And I think there's an unspoken hatred of the establishment now. Within three days, I think, of the launch of the play, a Prime Minister's questions, a Tory backbencher stood up. Could the Prime Minister please tell us which of his policies does he think is responsible for the defection to Labour of Mr Alan Bastard? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, I'm not in a position to comment on Mr Bastard, but what I can say to him is... It just reiterated the fact that Bastard was real, he wasn't a character out of a television sitcom. The marriage of mainstream sitcom and alternative comedy had created an original satire. The survival of Bastard is a tribute to Marx and Gran, male, and the power of satire to skew a new statesman, whatever their political hue. What have you been getting through in Parliament this week? Uh, two shorthand typists in the canteen, lady. I had never experienced anything like this with any show I'd ever visited or been responsible for, and to this day... We just had a ball doing it. I mean, I almost felt guilty about sort of taking the paycheck because it was so much fun to do. Any old tosh spot can become a Tory MP if he knows what palms to grease. Right. <clears throat> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, come on, get up and make a fight of it! Come on, get up, you little bastard, get up! <laughs> Please? Every moment in that Yorkshire television studio on a Friday night was as good an evening at the theatre as I think you could ever hope for from a television series. Well, that's just what I need first thing on a Friday morning, isn't it? A dead dwarf! <laughs> it makes me very, very happy playing, playing Alan. You bastard. <laughs> Star. <laughs> <laughs>